You know, as humans, we have the tendency to complicate things. Social psychologists call it the complexity bias. You know, we often prefer complicated explanations and solutions over simple, simple ones. It, it's as if our brains are wired this way. Uh, here are some examples. Uh, have you ever tried to buy a piece of furniture from Ikea? I remember my wife and I had just gotten married. We were decorating out our new apartment, and we had, I thought, a very simple table to put together. And I'm married a week or so, and it took me hours, and I was all bloody in my knuckles, and I'm thinking, what did I buy? It's a simple thing. How come it got so complex? Or how about whenever you need to do something with the DMV? I had one of those things happen to me just yesterday. I said to my wife, let's check our inspection on our car window, and we have a month or so for that, but we realized registration was due last month. And I'm thinking to myself, I never miss this kind of stuff. Like, I never miss it. And I realized, I think I logged into and selected notifications by email as opposed to receiving it in the mail every two years. And so I just forgot. And so I begrudgingly paid my $160 online, and my wife has a print-out registration until the sticker comes in the mail. But why make something that should be very simple? Just send me a letter and tell me I need to do it. Why make it so complex? Or how about when you are sick? Have you ever been under the weather, and all of a sudden you go to WebMD? And you have diagnosed yourself for every strange disease across the world. And you think to yourself, have I been in contact with anybody that was in Singapore recently? And you, know, you start going through the list in your mind, you know, and really what you just need is to go home, take a nap, eat some food, and go to work tomorrow. Or how about when you're trying to lose weight and you think, this year I'm going to figure out whatever that fad diet is that's going to work for me. No carbs, all carbs, no protein, all protein, no meat, all meat. And you start going through the list, what time of day and what is my rhythm of sleep and how do I fit that in when probably the simple solution for 98% of us is eat less and move more. I don't believe it, but that's what people tell me. Or how about when we complicate relationships at times? How about when someone doesn't say hi to you that normally does and your day starts off on a bad foot because you're thinking, what did I say to them? What did I do? Why are they mad at me? And you go through this in your mind all day long. And then at the end of the day, you go up to them and you say, hey, is something wrong? Is everything okay? You didn't say hi. And, and they look at you and just think, oh, no, I was just tired this morning. You now we have a way of making things that are really simple, complex. And the results in our life are often complexity breeding, perhaps, self-doubt or being overwhelmed. Or for some of us that like to complicate things, it enables us to have a little sense of superiority, like we truly understand this situation or this thing more than others. We should probably keep to the principle of KISS, K-I-S-S, -S. keep it simple, I said silly. You said that other one. I didn't call you that. I'm your pastor. I would never say that. Simplicity. Simplicity is different than being simplistic. Simplicity is saying, I will take something that is complex and vast, and I'll boil it down into something that is understandable and tangible and applicable. Being simplistic, that's something very different. It's, that's taking something and accepting an easy answer when it's actually more complicated than we realize. But for us this morning, we want to talk about simply what God calls us to as a follower of Jesus. We could become so over-informed over, uh, in our spiritual lives and find ourselves underperforming. We have access to more information, more podcasts, more sermons, more services, more life groups, more Bible studies, more study groups, more fresh start classes than you could ever imagine. And yet many of us find ourselves unable to take those next steps. And it feels like that shelf that, or, or that, 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 that table that was on the floor in thousands of pieces. And I'm thinking, I should have just got one that was put together. See, if we're not mindful, we bring complexity 
into our religious and spiritual life and our walk with God, and we miss the simple call to be a follower of Jesus. For the church, for followers of Jesus, I, I think we could summarize it simply like this. God calls us to be faithful to the great commission and the great commandment. That great commission, right? From Matthew 28, and to go and make disciples of all nations. A disciple is a follower of all nations of Jesus. And to be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And to teach others about the truths of Jesus. And to know that when we do that, he is with us. That's, that's what the church is about. We, we, we're not here as, a, as just a, a primarily a social club. We're, we're not here to just scratch that religious itch that we have one week so that we feel good with the other things we're doing with the other six days. No, we are inviting each other to follow Jesus, to follow his teachings, to trust in him, and knowing that his presence, his power is with us. And then the great commandment. That's what we have been discussing for these last few weeks together and they're bringing to a close today. The great commandment to love God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, and with all our strength, our muchness, as we talked about it a few weeks ago. And today we conclude by looking at that second commandment, which as well is so beautiful in its simplicity and yet so difficult and complex in the way we try to act it out. And that is to love your neighbor when you want to. Amen? Love your neighbor when you've had your coffee. Love your neighbor when it's not move ahead Sunday and I haven't slept a wink, you know? No, to love your neighbor as yourself. And this morning, as we close this series and look to this final verse I want to answer for us three simple questions that I think this second commandment asks of us. Three simple questions when we look to love our neighbor as ourself. And it's my prayer today that as we simplify what it means to be a follower of Jesus and to be a person that loves others, that we'll walk from here today asking of the Lord, Lord, who is my neighbor and how can I love them? I want you to turn with me in your Bibles. You'll see it here on the screen. This is our text of Scripture that we have been meditating on this month. This is from Mark's Gospel, beginning in verse 28. This is the word of the Lord. One of the scribes approached. When he heard them debating and saw that Jesus answered them well, he asked them, Which commandment is the most important of all? Jesus answered, the most important is listen, O Israel. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other command greater than these. Verse 32. Then the scribe said to him, you are right, teacher. You have correctly said that he is one and there is no one else except him. And to love him with all of your heart and with all your understanding and with all your strength and to love your neighbor as yourself is far more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. God. And no one dared to question him any longer. This is the word of the Lord. Amen? Today we focus in on that phrase in verse 31. Will we love our neighbor as we love ourselves? Here's the first question that we need to answer. How do you want to be treated? Remember that phrase, love your neighbor as yourself. Let's start from the end of that phrase, as yourself. We're going to talk about what uh, love looks like. We're going to talk about who your neighbor is in just a moment. But I want us to start this morning looking at ourselves and asking ourselves this question. How do you want to be treated? 
that our love for others, our sacrifice for others, our care for our neighbor comes out of an understanding of our own self-interests and desires. So list in your mind what are the things you'd like for yourself. And off the top of the bat, no doubt some of you are thinking more money in my bank account. Okay, we'll take that one out for a second. Okay, uh, More comfort and ease in this world, no problems, you know, all these things, you know, you know. What, what does God tell us are the things that we should truly want for ourselves? Well, once again, we look into our text, and it gives us some hints. Jesus, after hearing the reply of this scribe, says to that scribe, you are not far from what? The kingdom. That if you truly believe loving God and loving your neighbor are the commandments that you are to follow most faithfully, that if you truly believe that, you're not far from the rule and reign of God in your life. Remember, the question in this context is around which is the greatest commandment, that law that has been handed down. The scribe would have been an expert in the law of God. Those 613 rules, those do's and don'ts that set up for them the community of faith. And, and in summarizing it like this, Jesus is saying, if you believe and obey loving God and loving neighbor, you summarize the whole law and you're close to the kingdom of God. Remember, these, these laws of the Old Testament, the Mosaic Law, the Torah, they are meant to lay out the operating rules, if you will, for living in the community of faith. Sometimes we look at the law and we think of it in some New Testament terms of, a, of it being something that demands rote obedience and how God offers us grace by faith. But when originally given, the intention is that the community of people, the Israelite people, might know what it's like to live and love each other well and live and love God well. Why all the sacrifices? Why all these rules? Why all these seemingly to us antiquated rules and regulations for a society to operate by? It was so that being part of the people of God, the kingdom of God, they might love each other well. I want you to see in Leviticus chapter 19, the verse that is quoted for us in Mark 12. We notice that the first section of loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, we've said how that's found in Deuteronomy 6. That is the great Shema. That is that great prayer that is to be read at the beginning and the end of day for every follower of God. And Jesus applies this as well to himself. But the second commandment, to love your neighbor as yourself, this is a quote from Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. Leviticus, that book in the Bible that I often like to say, is the place where reading plans go to die, you know? You start off the year and you're like, I'm going to read the Bible, I'm going to make it through, and you get to Leviticus and you're lost. Uh, last year we read through the Bible together. I hope we gave you some helpful clues to think about how, into, how, to re, uh, uh, how to read and understand. But here in the book of Leviticus, it's, it's these various laws that are set up for the Levites, the priests, in order for them to help the community of faith love each other and love God well. And in verse 18 of Leviticus 19, it says this, Do not take revenge or bear a grudge against members of your community, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Further study, and we could do this at some other time, will show us that Leviticus 19, that chapter, is an expanded explanation of the Ten Commandments we find originally in Exodus chapter 20. That this chapter, and I could show you the correlations between the Ten Commandments and the verses listed herein in chapter 19, they lay out for us what it means to be a person that obeys the commands of God. And think about it. What are those commands? Like the ones that are listed here, they are ones where we are not bearing a grudge. The commandments of not coveting, the commandments of not stealing. How do you want to be treated? You want to be treated in a way where people care about you, are concerned about you, and are willing to not take advantage of you. This is the original meaning and context for loving our neighbor as our self. Do you want compassion? 
Do you want forgiveness? Do you want someone to steal from you? Do you want someone to covet your husband or your wife? Do you want someone to murder? See, what we want for ourselves is for all people to live the ultimate example of these commandments out in their life. And Jesus says, what you want for yourself, you should want for who? For everyone else. So I want you to go back in your mind and read through those Ten Commandments again in Exodus 20 and here in Leviticus 19 as well. And start listing and asking, Lord, what do I want? How do I want to be treated? Here's the exercise. I want you to think of that individual in your life who shows you the least amount of love. I know, I'm gone into meddling early this morning. I want you to think of that individual in your life that is the most difficult person to be with. That individual that as often and as, as faithfully as you try to avoid being around them, you just have to be around them. Does anybody have that person? You're all looking at me. I'm not that person. <laughs> I want you to ask, Lord, how do I want them to treat me? What do I want from them? Now, this is just the first step in learning how to love our neighbor as ourself. It's starting to think self-reflectively, Lord, what do I really want? What do I really need? We then go on, right? The second commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. Some of you may be thinking, oh, this is working good for me, my neighbor. Well, who is my neighbor? I, I want to live on the farthest ends of the block so that I only have one neighbor to the left or right of me. Or maybe you're thinking, oh man, I can't wait to get out of Staten Island. I've, I've done the, the Brooklyn, the Staten Island, the Jersey thing, and I can't wait to get down to Florida where I'm going to walk on the beach and not be around anybody. Or now I guess some of us like to go to South Carolina, all these other places, right? That I can't wait to take that step to be away and apart. But, but, but the scriptures tell us that our neighbor is not just that person who is geographically located next to us. That our neighbor has a different definition according to the scriptures. I want you to turn with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. Turn with me there in your Bibles. This is the parallel account of what we are reading in Mark chapter 12. Mark, many believe, is the earliest written of the Gospels, and Mark and Luke, excuse me, Matthew and Luke, use the material in Mark in their own. In fact, I believe there's only roughly 31 or so verses that are unique to Mark that are not found in Matthew and Luke. So when Luke writes his account, and if you've been hanging out with us in our daily podcast, we're reading through Luke right now, uh, Luke gives an orderly account a researched eyewitness account of what happens, and he writes it for his friend Theophilus. When, when Luke gives his account, he then inserts for us what is one of the most famous, if not the most famous of all parables. And it's a parable that helps answer for us the question of who is my neighbor. I want to read this section of scripture with you, beginning in chapter 10 of Luke in verse 25. Follow along with me. Then an expert in the law stood up to test him, saying, Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he said. How do you read it? Does this sound familiar from what we've read? He answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. You've answered this correctly. Do this and live. But wanting to justify himself. So in Luke's account, he gives a little bit more information, or at least a nuanced perspective. This man, this scribe says, and who is my neighbor? See, these are what the scribes would do. These are what the teachers of the law would do. They would ask questions and answer them and respond with more questions and this going back and forth. And as he hears Jesus talk about and validate what he believes is right is in, in the second commandment here, he asks the question, who is my neighbor? And that's what I want you to ask today as well. Who is your neighbor? And to answer it the way only Jesus can, he gives a story. Verse 30. 
Jesus took up the question and said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him, beat him up, and fled, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Uh Uh-oh, not good for the official religious people. Uh Uh-oh. In the same way, a Levite, don't they have a whole book named after them? When he arrived at the place and saw him, passed by where? On the other side. But a Samaritan on his journey came up to him, and when he saw the man, he had compassion. He went over to him, bandaged his wounds, pouring olive oil and wine. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him. When I come back, I'll reimburse you for whatever extra you spend. And Jesus ends with this question. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man? who fell into the hands of the robbers. The one who showed mercy to him, he said. Then Jesus told him, go and do the same. Here's the definition of a neighbor. You ready? Anyone who happens to be near. That's your neighbor. Anyone who happens to be near. Notice in this text that we have specifics that there was a priest, a Levite, the religious people that you might consider to be the most spiritual among the crew. Surely they will go to help the man. But it's a Samaritan and someone that was considered this mixed individual that was not loyal to Israel and the people of God for centuries. This land that was not completely right. A place that had an alternate place of worship. This unsuspecting character is the one who actually shows neighborly love. But I want you to notice the way the man is described. Are you with me? Look again at verse 30. A man. How do you like that descriptive? How do you like that adjective? Later on it says, Jesus in verse 36, which proved a neighbor to the man. Jesus gives all these details about the characteristics and backgrounds of these other characters, but for the one who is hurt, it is who? Anonymous and all-encompassing. Do you, do you get it? A man, a woman, anyone, anyone who happens to be near is your neighbor. Proximity should breed empathy, and it does for the Samaritan, but for the priest and the Levite, it brings complacency. Because these is, this is a, 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 a potentially someone who could hurt. You know, we live in a world that is always pitting us in us versus them categories. Always saying, who is your neighbor and who is your enemy? And oftentimes we distance ourselves from those that are different from us in order to feel safe and secure in who we extend our love and grace and time and compassion towards. And God tells us, your neighbor is a man, a woman, anyone you happen to be near. And you know what? In our world today that is overly connected more so than in any other time in history, we have the opportunity to literally hold in our hands and look at neighbors that may be across the world in a war-torn town or village or in a place of desperation and need across our city and our island and our nation. And it's so easy to think, are they one of us? Or are they one of them? Yet Jesus invites us to love our neighbor, whether near proximity spatially to us or near via our information about them, to love them as ourselves. Think of those things that you want for yourself. 
Think of the things that the law talked about. They were creating a just and righteous and holy society. They were obeying what seems to us as antiquated laws for an ancient Near Eastern setting, but they were for us a, a reminder to us today of, of God desiring that people live in community with each other, that justice is offered, that, that people have peace and compassion and forgiveness with each other. And just like we want that for us, every individual made in the image of God is your neighbor. Are you with me this morning? Not just the ones we like. Not just the ones that look like me. Not just the ones I agree with. Anne Lamott, a famous writer, says this. I love this line. You can safely assume you've created God in your own image when it turns out that God hates all the same people that you do. If we're not challenged by the call to love our neighbor as ourself, to love those that are difficult, those that are different, then we're missing the invitation to simply follow Jesus. G.K. Chesterton, the famous British theologian, says this, The Bible tells us to love our neighbors and also to love our enemies, probably because they're generally the same people. Miroslav Volf, who himself came out of a war-torn area, a modern-day theologian currently now at Yale University, talks about the two pillars of the distinctively Christian ethic. It is love of neighbor and love of enemy, only made possible because of the love of God for us. Are you with me this morning? Whether across the world, across our island, or across the hall, or across the bedroom from you. God calls us to love our neighbor. You've heard the story of a couple coming to a pastor, and they said to the pastor, we're going to get a divorce, but we want to come to you and make sure you're okay with it. We just don't have any feelings left for each other. They were hoping that the pastor would say, well, if there's no feeling left, then the only thing you could do is split up. But the pastor instead said to the husband, he looks at the husband and he says, the Bible tells us in Ephesians that you are to love your wife as Jesus Christ loved the church. And the man says, oh, can't do that. So the pastor says, well, if you can't begin at that level, I get it. Loving as Jesus loved, that's tough. He says, well, the Bible also tells us that you're supposed to love your neighbor as you love yourself. Can you at least love your wife as if she is your neighbor? And the husband looks at the pastor and says, oh, no, 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 you don't know my wife. That's still too high. So the pastor looks him in the eye and says to him, well, the Bible also says to love your enemies, so begin there. Who are those that are most difficult for you to love? They are your neighbor. Anyone you happen to be near, whether in spatial proximity or through means of information and technology and access, we are to long for others what we long for ourselves, flourishing, thriving, forgiveness, compassion, grace, love, mercy, patience. And that's where I want to end this morning as we close. As we work our way back to loving our neighbor as ourself, we ask that first question, what is love? Not to get overly philosophical, let's just turn to the scriptures here. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, hear are the ways that God calls us to love. Love is Patient. Let's stop there for a second. <laughs> What's one way, very concretely, that you could demonstrate love towards your neighbor, whoever that is, both near and far? Demonstrate patience. What is patience? Not demanding what I want on my timetable. But in a patient, long-suffering way, bearing with someone in order for them to come to a place of greater thriving with God and with others. Who has God called you to be patient with 
this week. Aren't you happy when someone's patient with you? Remember, love your neighbor as yourself. Has someone ever been impatient with you? Have you ever driven on Staten Island? Nobody? Okay, okay. All right, you know. Uh, I, I mean, man, we, we, we nail that horn a second we can, right? As soon as we can. And, and I felt myself uber spiritual a few weeks ago on Sunday morning when I was waiting at a light. And the person in front of me was not moving. And I was on my way to church to preach. And I thought, I will be patient, God. I will be patient, God. Because I know I need to. But in small and silly ways like that, but in greater ways. There are people that God has placed in your life that are difficult to love, that are hard, that, 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 that maybe are going through difficult things, that, that maybe don't have a full understanding of what they actually need in their life, and they need someone not just to come to them and tell them what to do and tell them to shape up, but someone that will sit with them and patiently say, I'll wait with you on this. Love is patient. Love is kind. Verse 4 of 1 Corinthians 13, kindness, that is a commodity that is scarce to find in today's world. Simple kindness, doing for someone what you would want to be done for you, considering the need of someone else and asking how can I encourage and support. We, we could go in depth on all of these. Love does not envy. It, it does not boast. It's not arrogant. It does not seek its own. It does not keep a record of wrongs. I cannot think of a more important way to remember love in relationships and in marriage specifically than if it is a love that keeps no wrongs. Some of us, and I, I, I've talked to certain individuals, they say to me, oh, listen, they do one more thing, I'm taking out my list. And I said, what do you mean? Like, oh, I have not forgotten anything these last 30 years. You think that's not, you? that is true story. And if I got to use it, I will. God tells us love keeps no record of wrongs. Aren't you happy that God does not hold our sins against us? That it says in the scriptures that when he forgives us, he casts away our sin as far as the east is from the west. That it's thrown into the depths of the sea. That this is the love of God for us. And as you read through the rest of that chapter and think through, we, we, we come to this realization. That it's because of the great love and sacrifice and patience of God towards us in Jesus that we are able to love our neighbor as ourself. So, what do you want for yourself? What do you wish that person would give to you? Who are the neighbors in your life? For some of us, it may be very explicitly the people across the street, and that is always true, but who are those other people, individuals, groups that are easy to place in an us-versus-them category as part of the other side of the equation that God might be calling you to show kindness towards? And then, how can you love? Let's not make it too complex. It, it, the Christian life, in, in, in essence, is quite simple. Do we know that good news of Jesus for ourselves, And are we willing to live it and share it in action with others? Love your neighbor as yourself.